is 11.03, and we should probably get started here. I'm going to spotlight myself. Got to make sure the recording captures everything. We've figured out that the recording of this video will not capture the full gallery view. We really wanted to, but haven't quite figured out how to get that fixed in Zoom. So always trying to spotlight people while they speak so I can make sure that they get on the recording. So uh, today is June 9th of 2023. This is Coffee with Community Services. My name is John Decker, the Director of Community Services for Alta California Regional Center. Coffee with Community Services is our weekly vendor meeting. And as I was just mentioning, these meetings are recorded. They are uploaded to the YouTube channel that Alta has and are also posted on Alta's website. As per usual, I'll introduce uh, our staff that we have on here and then jump into what we have for our agenda items for today. So um, from our community services department, I see Bobby this morning. So good morning, Bobby and Christy. Schaefer, good morning. And Rima, our deaf and hard of hearing specialist. Good morning, Rima. And let's see, from client services managers, I see uh, Dana and Rowena on. Good morning. And with service coordinator Jessica's on this morning. Good morning, Jessica. Let's see, we've got our uh, Intake and Clinical Director, Camelia Houston. Good morning, Camelia. And uh, Community Services Manager, Jordan, who you're gonna be hearing from a little bit later. And we have Helen Neary, another one of our Community Services Managers, and Heather Hollingworth. Good morning, Heather, as well. Um, acute Care Coordinator. Um, maybe we can, I don't know, have we talked about that position at this meeting before? We haven't. Oh my gosh, we just developed a new agenda item. We should probably, <laughs> we should probably let folks know about this. So um, I just realized that we have not shared this with our, our vendors yet. So uh, Kanisha as well. Good morning, Kanisha, Client Services Manager. Uh, Jason, our Lead Community Services Specialist. Good morning, Jason. Let's see, Gary's on for Community Services. Good morning, Gary. Beverly, Danny. Uh, I see Client Services Manager. I see Laura Goramon and Cindy as well. Good morning. And Zach, my assistant on page two. Let's see who we got over here. Uh, Community Services Manager Michelle Duchesne is on. I see our, let's see, Client uh, Employment Specialist Carly's on. QA Specialist Scott is here. Shirley is joining us again. Uh, Shirley from Community Services and Adriana and Leah. Let's see what Leah's on here. Let's see, Client Services Managers um, Phil is on and I see uh, Associate Client Services Director Johnny Zhang and I see Director of Client Services Jennifer Bloom is on here this morning too and I see Carrie and Shelly as well from our community service excuse me service coordinators I almost got a little confused there all the uh, pictures that pop up so we're going to get started here with the agenda um, I will uh, ask Rima if she'll get us started first on the agenda and then we will move to the DSP workforce survey and then we'll do a little update as much as we can about the budget. Um, I want to talk a little bit about a project, a housing project that I was working on this week and sharing kind of those experiences. We've got some upcoming vendor forums. We have um, a bunch of things, EI job fair, multi, uh, micro enterprise fair, which, oh, I don't know if the micro enterprise fair has yet made it onto our calendar. I hope that it has um, on our events calendar. Otherwise, someone is going to have to remind me of the date for like the 10th time this week. Um, and then we have, uh, we did the vendorization for the UC Davis Redwood Seed Program, talk briefly about that. We have an update to the RFP for um, ASL um, uh, CPP, well, CRDP uh, project. And we have uh, HCBS contracts update that uh, either Michelle or Alicia will go over. And we will also talk about our acute care coordinator position. So if I can throw it to Rima first, and then Rima, I want to, uh, if we can go over the word of the week and the Deaf Culture 101, and then I also want to talk about the DSP collaborative website. So once you're done, kind of throw it back to me, and then we can discuss the idea about the DSP collaborative website with putting the languages. So I will throw it over to you now, and I'm going to spotlight you. I'm going to not spotlight myself. Hello. Good morning, everyone. So the sign of the week is emergency. And that is signed like this.
it's important that you show facial expression as well to show the severity of the emergency. As you can see on my face, ooh, it's, a, it's an emergency. That shows how severe it is. Oh, we have a little emergency or, oh my God, we have a huge emergency. Um, that will show um, the degree of the emergency based on your facial expressions. So do we need to leave? It's an emergency. Um, that may be something that you may wanna know for the future. And uh, while I have the spotlight, Deaf Culture 101, in regards to emergency, uh, we recently had an earthquake and I was on the sixth floor. I felt it and I was like, what's going on here? Everyone was kind of looking at me, trying to communicate with me. So I thought, well, this could get awkward. So uh, I thought maybe throwing out some signs in terms of communicating when there is an emergency. Uh, pantomime is something that you can use, actions, gestures, uh, that's uh, easily understood. Uh, it's kind of a universal language uh, that can be used with our body language and gestures, like I was saying. And then also reading lips. Um, not every deaf person can read lips. And for myself, I don't read lips very well. Um, it just depends on that individual. Some people are very, very good at being able to understand uh, people and reading their lips. It also depends on maybe the environment, if it's a well-lit space or dark space. It's important also to keep eye contact when communicating with a deaf person. Also, writing back and forth is another um, you know, another way to communicate, but I would try to keep that simple and in easily understood language. And then also sign language, that would help so much just learning some basic sign language when communicating with a deaf person. Um, like for example, my, I wanted to say thank you to Michelle, my manager for posting that on our floor. We have different pictures um, and it, they should be on all floors, uh, especially the first floor because that's where we have um, what I'm referring to is the basic emergency signs that's posted. So thank you, Michelle. And then interpreting, uh, and having an interpreter is the best approach when wanting to talk with the deaf individual. But in case of an emergency or you've got a shelter, um, you do wanna ask for an interpreter um, so that information is con conveyed as clearly as possible when that information is needed. And then um, deaf people also, you know, will tend to reply with a head uh, like a, a head nod. It doesn't mean that we always agree. It just means like, okay, keep going. I'm with you. This is part of the, you know, normal way of communicating. And don't assume that means that the head nod means yes. It's just kind of saying, yeah, I'm following you. I'm understanding and we're communicating clearly. And if you were to feel like mm, something's not getting across right, may want to change the way you're communicating that message to make sure that both of you, you know, you're both understanding each other clearly. You also may notice that deaf people may be signing too fast or in very big signs. It could mean that the person's under an amount of stress and their emotions are running high. Uh, it doesn't mean like they're being aggressive or they're being in control. It just means that they're stressed and they may be signing very fast or signing very big. And you may read that wrong thinking this person's out of control, but that's not the case. And also it's important to recognize uh, the environment. Uh, uh, isolation is, you know, it, it happens sometimes when, you know, that person is not communicated with. Um, so it, I think it's just, it helps uh, relieve stress, you know, when you're able to talk to the people that are around you. Um, And you may need uh, to sign slow or you may need an interpreter. And depending on the situation, sometimes we need to just make sure there's that understanding and make sure that each other has patience and making, and making sure that communication happens. So thank you very much. Excellent. So I'm going to leave Rima spotlighted. I'm going to try to add my spotlight back here. Um, and so there was a suggestion that was brought up by Rima and I'm going to share our screen. I don't know if we have any Maxim folks on, but I'm going to be sharing your um, entry on the DSP website. And so share my screen. 
All right, Bobby, are you seeing the DSP Maxim website there? Yeah, perfect, excellent. Okay, Rima, so would you mind sharing, and Eric, this is the topic that I had uh, mentioned earlier that I was hoping maybe you might, because you're obviously uh, fundamental in the development of this, as have uh, other vendors, and I don't know if we have Garrett on, or I know I believe Michelle's off today from on my own, but um, so Rima, you had a, a suggestion as it related to the website and adding some content to these, and so if you would not mind sharing that. Sure. So uh, I noticed that a lot of the posts are job opportunities and different types of services, which I think are great and amazing. But I also thought yeah, maybe we could add languages. Um, suppose that group uses um, American Sign Language or another group is strongly using um, Spanish uh, and they have like a bilingual person. It may be just nice to put down what languages are strongly spoken within that group. That way, if a person is looking for something, they go, ooh, okay, I know that language. I may be able to fit into that area very nicely. So just a thought. Excellent. And I'm going to stop sharing my screen real quickly, if I can find where the button went. And um, I would open that up. There. I mean, many of you vendors have your information that are on the website. Um, and I know that you're broadly, you know, um, advertising for people to come work for your companies, but I do... But I do like the idea of being able to have that. And so I just wonder what the thought, thoughts are. Well, you said you're going to ask me, so I'll just start. Yeah. I think it's interesting. I think it's good. Um, I haven't thought of it because we typically think of that in terms of our participants. So trying to signal for folks looking for programs, what languages we might be able to support um, other than English. But I guess, yeah, I mean, we could add something there for the staffing portion. Um, I, th I think so. The only thing I would say for me is if you're a single agency that provides it, maybe like one or two services, chances are your language support is equal in both of those categories. But maybe for like for my company, my like like where I'm looking to recruit for languages and where that where that would be relevant wouldn't be for all of my positions. So you know if I said like we were you know actively looking with like like say Russian speakers or. Um, you know, Punjabi or something like that, that might be more for respite than let's say transportation or day programs. But I mean, I don't know why you can just put, you know, actively seeking candidates with the following experience, you know, or the following language. languages. Yeah, I mean. So As I, I think what, what you know, Rima's argument might be, and we can ask her to make it, and I can certainly make my argument for it, is that if you don't put it out there, you're not going to draw as much possibly of a diverse group of people. And if the idea is that we want to make people feel comfortable and we're and being able to go to a workplace where their language is is utilized by their peers then it's just i think it's more of a this is a better way possibly to advertise for yourselves because you might get those folks that might feel really comfortable working in that type of setting um that was kind of that my my thoughts about it and then rima did you have anything different as it related to that yes and often, you know, with different languages, I understand, you know, they may want their own language and may want to communicate in their own language where it's easier to participate and join in. And not only that, but it's nice to have a client that feels comfortable and in that area where, oh my gosh, they speak the same language and they can have that communication. But it does apply to both you know, clients and the employer. I would just say uh, I don't need the entire audience to weigh in on their thoughts about that because many of you have your job ads that are on here right now. But if you want to shoot me an email um, with your thoughts about it to jdecker at alterregional.org, I would appreciate that, um, you know, as it relates to, especially if you're one of those people that has your ads on there already and are interested in utilizing it um, because I think that feedback is good. And then what I'd like to do is, take the feedback, you know, that we heard here and then also whatever comes in via email and then Erica, when we meet with the larger group again and have our next group session, then maybe we can have that discussion with Scott about making possibly a change to the, even the, like if there's a field that we might even talk about adding to the, um, the request form, the, you know, the, the application form that vendors fill out. So like I said, we can talk about that more, but I wanted to get it out and, and have an open discussion about it, so. All right. 
Excellent. Thank you very much, uh, Rima. Um, all right. So I'm going to, let's see, I'm going to remove Rima's spotlight. Got to remember to do these things or the recording gets a little messed up. And then I'm going to go over to Heather and I'm going to add a spotlight to Heather Hollingworth. And I'm going to also add a spotlight to Jordan, who is Heather's manager as well, because you guys both may want to weigh in on this real quick. So um, the acute care coordinator position, our managers are aware of this. Um, we've got some changes to our heart staffings and then kind of a new position. So um, Heather, I'll let you kind of take it away and then Jordan jump in as you feel appropriate. Sure. Um, okay, so starting uh, last month, um, I started the acute care coordinator position and my primary responsibility is to support service coordinators and also any other um, ACRC agency persons with anyone that has a consumer in the hospital. Um, I also am working with hospitals, reaching out, kind of looking for that um, that collaborative stance on any um, medical needs or hospital needs. Um, so all in all, I'm kind of a liaison between Ulta, the providers and the hospitals. So that is kind of in a nutshell what I'm doing. Um, yeah. Um, and, and real quickly, maybe we there, can explain but, a little okay. bit, Heather, why you are kind of suited for this position. So first, this is a position that I know I have been very interested in at the regional center for quite some time and Sparkle Crenshaw, when she was the deflection specialist, kind of helped develop a little bit of the ideas behind this position because she was so good at going to the hospitals and doing assessments and, and Andy Perez kind of took on some of that stuff as well as our deflection specialist. But, you know, being the hospital whisperer or being able to help really coordinate things does take a very good special skill set. and so. Uh, Heather, uh, before this, before coming to the regional center, was with uh, one of our service providers. So why don't you just share real quickly about your backgrounds, because not everyone knows you. Sure. Heather, yeah. Um, okay. So I, um, before I came to Alta, and actually before I worked um, primarily with the DD population, I worked and got my nursing home administrator license. And then I went off and I worked with ICF, DDNs, and DDHs, um, seven of them, for almost, let's see, past over nine years, so almost a decade. Um, and I actually kind of made my first big contact with Alta because I went in and um, kind of fought with the hospital um, about um, wanting to um, put one of our clients onto hospice care for no apparent reason. So that's kind of how I started my relationship with Alta, and I found that that's one thing that I'm really, really passionate about is just ensuring that our community sees our clients as more than um, what they think, um, and that they're not um, they're not like every other person. Um, they uh, all have their own positives, negatives, etc., and that a lot of them have a lot more to say and do than what a lot of our medical professionals see. Um, and so, so yeah, so that's kind of where I started and with my ICF background and having lots of relationships with hospitals around the Sacramento area, I really wanted to have that grow. So John's like, oh, that sounds like a good idea. Um, go get your master's. We'll talk about it more. So I did and bada bing, bada boom, here I am. So that's in a nutshell, kind of how I got to where I was or where yeah. I am. And, and what's great, yeah, because Heather recently got her master's in public health. And, you know, we're really looking at this role as building relationships with the hospitals, right? Redu reducing our clients' protracted hospital stays, right? The heart committee that we have internally stands for hospital emergency admission response assessment response or something like that right. so <laughs> yeah so we'll have we're going to have a heather will be the kind of the main facilitator of that committee moving forward helping to provide education and um recommendations to our case management staff and then in the long run right really helping to us to build relationships with these hospitals and um, educate the hospitals on our service system right so that they can better understand what our availability is when we have a client who is in need of a safe discharge and that we're needing some time to take care of that so we're super excited about this position heather also does all of our specialized resource development for our um, adult residential facilities for persons with special health care needs um, she's also assigned to our group push in, which is which is a, a group home for children with special health care needs. So really excited about the opportunities um, of working with case management on this and also um, building, you know, stronger relationships with our hospital stakeholders. 
Excellent. Thank you very much. Okay, now we can start our first agenda item. Uh, I, thank you, Heather. I know, uh, you know, sometimes we like to put you guys on the spot for these types of things, but uh, it is good for folks to know about this. Again, as our agency gets larger and larger, and if anyone, I mean, I supervise service coordinators for seven years, and so I will just share that dealing with these things can take up an immense amount of time. And when you have three, four different discharge planners, nurses, and other people contacting you for the same information all day long, it can be really taxing as a service coordinator. And so, again, having that person that can really help out and be that that that, uh, that go between and really um, help form those relationships, because the turnover of staff at the hospitals too is something that we you know certainly have to deal with, right? And so, um, anyways, I'm very glad that our agency is able to do this. Hopefully, this is going to provide some relief and better outcomes more than anything else for our clients, right? Just like Heather talked about. So, um, thank you very much. Appreciate that information. Um, I am going to jump over to the DSP Workforce Collection Survey. I'm going to share my screen real quick. And let's see, Christy or Schaefer, are you seeing DDS's website? Yep, awesome. Okay. So um, this is the, uh, the presentation I think Michelle did about this. Michelle Johnson was what, over a month ago. And so not much has changed other than, you know, they've, released additional documents and they really want us to be promoting this widely amongst um, our service providers. Again, uh, last year, you should be seeing the DSP survey flyer that they have here. Last year, they really, um, you know, we did a lot of promoting through our provider advisory committee, um, a lot of promoting through uh, this meeting here. I think we even had DDS come and talk with us about it. So. Um, all the information is on here. We really recommend that folks do this. Again, this is an opportunity to have your voice heard um, by the Department of Developmental Services as it relates to your DSPs and the costs and the um, you know activities. So I just I want to make sure that folks take those opportunities and that they are able to collect their um, eight thousand uh, dollars. Again, lots of materials on DDS's website that they've put on here as well. Frequently asked questions, etc. So I wanna encourage folks to please fill that out. And while I am here, I'm gonna to go to DDS's website and I know we've got upcoming employment uh, verification meetings. Yeah, so we've got office hours set up for the um, EVV. And so definitely wanna encourage folks to, if you have not gotten signed up for the employment visa verification, I don't know how, um, we wanna ensure that if you're having any issues, you please log in, check the website um, and get that information. Let me ask before I go too far away from the DSP workforce survey, is there any questions about how to access this information from DDS? Again, it's, it's kind of like right there on their website. And um, I know we are putting it out via our um, MailChimp service that goes to all of our service providers as well. I'm Michelle Ramirez, go ahead. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. Okay, yeah, I just wanted to share that um, there is a delay. We're experiencing a delay with GDS. We submitted our uh, registration uh, right away when the first link came out. And um, it's been at least a month or more since we've actually received the second layer to that uh, to actually complete the survey. And so we've been emailing DDS and they said that they're behind, but the deadline is the 30th. So we requested that possibly they extend the deadline. I haven't heard anything about that, but I just wanted everybody to know if you are still waiting to get that survey link, that there is some delay for some reason, and we haven't been able to get any sort of ETA on that. Uh, so I will have a meeting with uh, DDS next. I'll be at the uh, ARCA executive directors meeting on Thursday of next week doing my report because I'm the co-chair of the community services directors group. And so I will try to get an update specifically from DDS on, you know, and they will probably do it anyways because they usually like to update on their initiatives. But this is good feedback. We I don't think we heard about this yesterday during the provider advisory committee meeting. And I so I forgot. So, yes, if we could get an extension just for those vendors that are still waiting. Um, it's Can just I a see lot of data it? and to put in, you know, to, it's like hundred something questions. So if we could get a, an extension for those vendors that haven't gotten their link yet, that'd be great. I mean, they need this to work. They need you guys to be able to do this. And so let, let's, um, uh, okay, let me just ask for other service providers that are here, have others been able to get their registration through successfully yet? Or is everyone experiencing what all my own is experiencing? 
Well, I just want to clarify, we got our registration in, but then you have to wait for the link. There's some something okay, so you they, have, they have to they have something to do internally with your information. I guess maybe they do some cross-checking. Like last time I know that there were some errors with people, you know, because the link goes to the link goes to their contractor, right? That's running the survey materials yes. or whatever. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so yeah, can, yeah. Okay. Okay. I will see if I can get an update from that on Thursday and I will be back here on Friday of next week for coffee with community services. So I'll I will remember. Jordan, don't let me forget. Helen, don't let me forget. Okay. Okay. Zach never lets me forget. I don't even need to say it. Um, all right. Uh, the budget. We got a budget update yesterday at the Provider Advisory Committee. I thought it was great. I think um, one of the highlight of the discussions that we had yesterday was the um, uh, rate fix for ILS and the fact that, you know, it's in the uh, proposed language for the, I guess it would be in the trailer. It's going to end up in the trailer bill, not the mayor revision. It'll end up in the trailer bill, and so, um, not the mayor revision. Excuse me, end, end up in the trailer bill instead of the budget change. Uh, the uh, also know that there's the bill that's going on concurrently as well, right? So we have a bill that's going through, and then we also concurrently have the California kind of budget writing process through the trailer bills that are being done. So. Either way, I think from what I heard yesterday and from everything I'm hearing that the ILS rate fix is making it and we it is something to be expected. We know that the proposals would not have it begin until January of 2024. Um, and that was the discussion that we had yesterday. Um, and is that pretty official, folks? Does that sound right? January of 2024. So that would give us six months to get, you know, rate fixes figured out and then because they don't have the numbers yet, right? We still have to do the calculations based off of the BLS codes. Am I saying that right? Correct. Okay. okay. Michelle had a horrible echo on her line there. That was weird. Um, and so uh, thank you. And so with that being said, I mean, maybe next Friday we might know, maybe the Friday after that. Um, we'll have more of a budget update um, and we can let you know kind of what finally ends up in there. Um, again, uh, lots to be excited about. I will tell you the housing uh, money is still in there as far as I know. That's the reallocation of the fiscal year 2020 funds um, to this next year. So that would be, you know, us still being on track to get our housing project in uh, Lake of the Pines uh, done. So that would be very exciting as well. Um, I don't really, you know, I don't really have much else as far as an update on the budget until we get, you know, something official here in the next couple of weeks. And then there's always a lot of activities that happen after that. I will say we continue to have discussions about the rate study implementation and the budget. And um, we had a presentation yesterday by Harry um, from Pathpoint down in uh, Tri Counties area, and uh, he Harry's come to this group before. Uh, and uh, there was a presentation that was previously given to the performance measures, performance incentives, uh, performance incentives, I think, um, work group. And uh, it, there was an updated presentation. So in essence, what it's discussing is that by the end of June of 2024, everyone's rates are going to be standardized and the rates, you know, the full rate implementation includes, you know, everything up into 10% of the final rate that is in the rate study. And for some service providers that saw little to no increases with the rate study, then that if their the money is not paid that last 10%, then they would realize a, a rate decrease. Um, and for a lot of providers, there's concerns because the measures have not been formed in order to um, be able to earn that last 10%. And um, how we form those measures and make the determinations that folks are in line with them all before the end of next year, because that's when people would start needing to be paid out at that higher rate, effective July 1 of 2024. So it does not seem like it's realistic. It sounds like there's going to be some further requests to um, do an interim fix on this, but we don't have anything definitive per se right now at this time. Um, I will just share that uh, it seems like there's some very strong advocacy from the service provider groups. Uh, to ensure that there's a thoughtful approach that's made towards this, what they call this 90-10 issue. We will certainly, as there is more um, 
uh, information that comes out about it, we'll certainly update folks uh, on that too. Let's see. All right. What just popped up in the chat right now? Shamir popped up in the chat. Let's see what it says. Good afternoon. I was in a meeting for language access grant. I look forward to learning from everyone. Right on. Well, why don't we learn from Shamir real quick? Shamir, is your camera on? Where, where can I find you? Yeah, my camera's on. Right on. Hey, can I talk to you for a moment? You got a moment? Sure. Well, right on. Hey, so uh, who are you? And what do you do at Alta California Regional Center? Hi. Um, for those of you who have not met me, I am Shamir Kali Griffin. I'm the Cultural Diversity Specialist for Alta California Regional Center. Um, I do a lot of things. Um, I establish relationships with um, community partners and try to and look at um, our POS disparity when it comes to those who have historically had a harder time accessing um, regional center funds or regional centers uh, uh, services through either our language access grants or partner, partnering to help address things such as going out to communities uh, and meeting them where they're at. Uh, that's a huge thing that I'm, I'm trying to make sure that we do, um, as well as event coordination, making sure we have a presence and that we have cultural representation of both our SCs and our staff that represents the community that they serve, um, talking with local community business organizations, um, community-based organizations on how we're able to better serve them, getting feedback from our parents, partners, um, as well as uh, doing educations and trainings. Um, also, we're, we're still establishing an intake navigation program with two local uh, community-based organizations, HIPU, to target the Hmong community, as well as with La Familia Counseling Center, to target the Spanish-speaking community, as well as those living in South Sac and the rural area of Galt. Um, as a way of helping increase our um, the awareness of regional center in the area, as well as uh, increasing access, understanding what are the unique community needs, and making sure our service coordinators are empowered um, and informed on how they can best reach and work with families and community members in a, a culturally competent as well as cultural um, culturally humble way. Um, yeah, there's a lot more I can say, but I tend to uh, be very verbose, so I'll just. <laughs> no, this uh, is great. And uh, so let me ask you, so for Haipu and for um, La Familia, those projects are just getting up off the ground, the yep. kind of intake assistance navigation? Yeah, so intake, nav intake navigation just start. We started with them last month. They're still hiring the navigators. I think, I think La Familia already has a navigator. We're waiting one for Haipu, and we're also another project that we're working on is, um, or that just, just got finished was recording eight services that a lot of families need to know in both um, English, Hmong, and Spanish, as well as providing and over the course of videos and providing them to um, different groups so that they're able to access them through either web access or being able to access them through um, their service coordinator. So if they have questions about things like ABA therapy, about respite they're able to access those, like information about that from someone who uh, speaks the language and, and is also culturally competent through video means without having to worry about going through all these clicks online, which can be very disorienting. My job is also to help um, change the view of the regional center from being a center of, that just says no, because a lot of cultures, it's very difficult to reach out to an RSC because we are typically a vendor of um, last, last choice, last service. Uh -huh. um, and if you're coming from like a lot of cultures like that you have to they don't want to be rejected in the first place and talking about a learning disorder a mental dis illness or a disability is already pretty taboo so to have to ask for assistance and then be told yes get rejected from somewhere else first and then come to us is a lot for our families so it's like um also developing relationships with a lot of community members on how to best access services when what they need and like guiding them to the right places without um leaving them like out and alone also making sure that we, our families are well informed about what services we have because there seems to be a couple of people who have made it through the door and i think a common feedback i've gotten from both black some native american and also latino communities from just chatting with them during um parent meetings was uh -huh. That a lot of times they go to their, there's some of them are already clients, but they have no idea what we offer. 
and there's the fear of they want to ask for something, but they don't know what to ask for. So they just get so comfortable with just being a narcissistic client, but they don't know what there is except for respite. And although there's a 17 page guide on children's services or adult services, wherever we meet their child at, a lot of families uh, don't necessarily know about that. And if they do, it's, it's a lot to process. So we have to be able to break down what, what success for a family for they need, as well as break down what options and things are available. When I'm constantly on the community, even when I'm like uh, doing things like when I'm selling books uh, on my book tour, or when I'm dancing across the state for at powwows, or even when I'm out in the bars, I'm constantly meeting people who are either parents of or actually currently regional center clients. And I'm finding myself having to like give them information on things that they didn't know exist. I can't say how many families didn't know about social rec or even know about a respite or this or disbelief and stuff. So. Well, thank you. I thank you very much. And I think that is an excellent summary of a lot of the activities that are going on and the desire to where we want to more uniformly apply this across all the activities at our regional center. So with that being said, I wonder, and I will look to Michelle and Helen was our previous cultural diversity specialist uh, yeah. before she originated the position at our regional center and is now one of our community services managers. But I wonder about the opportunity for Shamir to sit in on some of the vendor forums to hear from the service providers and maybe share a little bit with some of the service providers because you know we have this big huge community of service providers that can really help with a lot of this education and outreach that needs to happen and i when i talk about this and and thank you again shamir for me putting you on the spot to, to do this but you know i think of um you know michelle johnson and i and going out just a couple months ago to doing a town hall in um uh, yolo county and listening to all of the parents and just the lack of information that so many had about our available resources. Um, and so again, uh, thank you very much, Shamir, for the information. And um, Michelle and, and Helen and, and Jordan, let's uh, talk about maybe looking at those invites for the, uh, for the vendor forums for Shamir so he can get to know maybe a few more of our service providers. But this is also a great place too to uh, get to know folks. So. Thank you very much again for that, Shamir. Oh yeah, I would love to definitely be involved. I know that I recently, re I've, re I've been receiving inquiries from certain um, SEs in different areas saying that although they have a large population, like one example being in Yuba, there are several hundred families who speak Punjabi as a primary language, but a lot of the vendors in the area don't necessarily have Punjabi speaking um, employees. So it leads to there being a disparity not because the service isn't available, but because it isn't accessible in their language. Whereas in other areas, like we, there are actually services available, like Sacramento has a pretty good mixture of language, um, linguistic capacities. Um, we have just cultural norms that tend to dissuade people from wanting to use services. I know when I was in IC, a large amount of my Southeast Asian families would not utilize respite services because uh, they felt it was their parental need or, or the parental responsibility to raise their child and that they did not want either EOR service or um, agency respite because they felt like culturally speaking that was part of their collectivist culture and I had to be I had to be understanding of that that, that was how they viewed it and that I like and that led to its own um, it looks like a number number wise it looks like, like, like it's not being offered but in reality it is being offered but culturally speaking they're not going to utilize it so it's like also having to be humble about that while also trying to educate and allow people to just navigate the scenario. So I'm always down. Excellent. Thank you very much. I'm going to throw it to Jordan, who just dropped that link in the chat for us. All right, perfect. So I'm going to share screen. Thanks, Sean. We just have a few minutes before we have to head over to a little presentation. Oh, you so do? Gonna... Yes, you and Michelle. Yeah, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to quickly share my screen. Are you guys seeing the Alto website? Yes. Okay, excellent. So um, the regional center has put out a third notice for um, one of this year's requests for future proposals for our community resource development plan. Um, we had previously um, proposed this project as a two part. It was going to be a, a vendorization um, for in-person ASL um, interpretation services in the outlying areas. YOLO, Yuba, Sutter, right? Some of our some of our outlying areas. And the second part 
was to develop a signing staff registry pilot program that we could create a registry of individuals who have the skill set to, to sign. They might not have the skill set to be a formalized ASL interpreter yet. However, they have some skill set. And then with a, a developed registry, we would have REMA work with our local vendors to see which programs were in need of hiring staff that have the ability to sign and then work on collaborating with those vendors and, and REMA and the registry um, the registry applicant, right, who, whoever's awarded this project. Um, if you go onto our website, you will see a very um, detailed description of the project. Um, the startup funds for this project are up to $75,000. Um, it's not a guarantee that it will be $75,000, but somewhere between $25,000 and $75,000. And there's very detailed descriptions of the project. For the sake of my time today, I won't read this for you, but for anyone who would be interested, this is a, a huge need for us. Um, Rima had collected a lot of stakeholder feedback about the need for signing staff, and I'm, I'm sure many of our, our vendors that are on today know the need for this service. So we're really hoping we get an applicant. Um, I know that one individual had reached out about potential interest, and they had let us know that they couldn't guarantee, right? They, had, they couldn't guarantee they could get in-person interpretation services, so they hadn't applied. So we got approval from DDS to actually drop the requirement to be a vendor interpreter and just help us with the signing staff pilot registry. So we are we are really excited about this program. We really hope we get an applicant. If you have any questions, um, our contact information is on the website, Rima is myself. So, so please give us a call um, or shoot us a text or an email. Um, really hope to hear back from the community on this one. The due date for the proposal would be next Thursday, June 15th. Um, John, while I have you guys, I also wanted to share that all of our vendors should have received an email that are signed up for MailChimp, right? That we have their email address, that we do have a new SIR that is out. So I will, um, as soon as I stop sharing, I'll put the link out. But really, the new SIR is just including the formal medication errors from um, categories when we have a med error, what those specifically are. And actually, just one second, I think I can. Are you guys now seeing the SIR screen? Yep. Perfect. So the only changes that you're really going to see are on page three. So we've added the specific, um, the specific categories for suspected abuse and exploitation. We've also added the specific categories for suspected neglect and failure to provide care. And then victims of a crime, right? Those before were just described within the SIR questions, but now it'll be a nice way for us to formally track that and have vendors be identifying to what they think is the suspected abuse or neglect. And then you'll see the medication errors um, categories right down here. I'm gonna quickly scroll up Hope not give you motion sickness to the first page. We also just added whether the individual is conserved, if the individual knows that, and whether or not they're on self determination. That helps our SIR desk kind of identify who needs to be notified of this of this SIR. So, um, any questions on that? Doesn't look like it. Okay, I will. I'm sorry, um, I know I had to I'm talk fast. I know. Don't worry about it. Jordan's going to go run over and go new, to new employee orientation. And okay. Michelle, I think, already took off to go over to new employee orientation. So okay, thank perfect. you very much, Jordan. Okay. I'm thank still you. here, John. Did you want me to share about oh, HGS yes. Sorry. Quick? If, you would, if you would not mind, yes. I'll run over, way. Michelle. Okay. That's right. Okay. It'll, it'll be one minute. I'll, I'll talk fast. Um, just to let everyone know, Alicia's actually at the training Jordan's headed to, but um, our HCBS specialist. But anyone that received a grant for the 2022-2023 um, HCBS grant. Uh, we just got word from DDS yesterday that all contracts need to be signed by the 30th. So by the end of this month or those funds are lost. So Alicia sent out an email to all the providers yesterday, just requesting your scope of work by the 23rd of this month so that she'll have time to pull those contracts together and um, get those over for you for signature. And Thank I will you. put her email in the, sorry, John, I'll put her email in the chat for any questions. Thank you very much, Michelle, and uh, we will excuse Michelle so she can also go over to new employee orientation, but um, I did 
want to make sure we discuss that and just put an apology out there that we just got the information from the department uh, yesterday during our provider advisory committee meeting, um, when the, which is when they were having the HCBS evaluators meeting. Um, I also participate in the um, statewide risk management group that's held by the directors of client services. And we had um, that meeting uh, this week. And in that meeting, there was some discussions and I just wanna talk about the SIR reporting form that, that uh, Jordan was just discussing. So um, as you guys you know, have at least been hearing for the last four years with when Dr. Gali took over as secretary was that we're moving to a more data-driven system. Many of you are aware of the big activities that are going on with the state to modernize the consumer electronic record management system, also known as CIRMS affectionately. Um, and so with that, one of the things that we added a while ago was what kind of medication errors um, that they were, because there's different types of medication errors. And this will allow us by having the form updated to make it a little bit easier and that for us to do the uh, coding of them, because as our agency grows, so does the number of special incident reports that come in. The other thing is, um, and I will just say uh, as note to our service providers, Service providers have been required to send their restraint SIRs to um, state council for, excuse me, disability rights for at least, what, a year or two now at this point. Um, the change occurred where the reports are now required to go to DDS and then DDS looks at them and then they go over. Um, I will just note that they noted a significant increase in reporting that was made once it was required that they come to DDS first instead of going directly to disability rights. So. I will say kudos to those of you service providers, if any of you are on here today that have been you know, doing those reports and uh, of uh, any alleged um, restraints or anything like that, and, and that's now going to the correct place, but um, they did see an increase of, in that. Uh, additionally, as it relates to risk management, you know, there are significant changes that are kind of in the works um, as far as uh, Title 17 changes. Um, and, uh, or excuse me, not tell us it, well, SIR reporting category changes. And um, Phil Perez, I think, was at the department when they were talking about those uh, changes to the categories for, for SIR reporting. So um, anyways, it, it's been going on for quite some time. It's going to happen. They're trying to standardize things, but we need to update our forms to make it a little bit easier for us to communicate the information right now to the department. Um, we have upcoming vendor forums and we have upcoming um oh it does still doesn't look like the micro enterprise fair made it onto the um onto the calendar i'm going to share my screen real quick um to it alta's be there soon john it should be okay yeah I, it was requested to add on so i'm sure it'll be on there soon oh you know what's on here is the first thing is the sacramento pride event is any I, Wyatt usually comes to these meetings and he's been doing a lot of the coordinating is there anyone else that's like helping coordinate that is interested in sharing real quickly about what we're doing on sunday All right, then I will provide a brief update on what we're doing on Sunday. So we're going to be getting oh. together. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Shmir. Yeah, yes, please. Real quickly, please. Hi. Um, yeah, I'm, me and Wyatt are the people who are in charge of organizing it. So on Sunday, we're going to be go, uh, we'll be meeting over at um, Southside Park. Um, for those of you who are going to be attendants, it's a, a reminder that this during Sacramento Pride, SAC RT is free. So if you want to get like a free ride, um, towards the areas so that you don't have to park. Um, <laughs> it's a great way to save money. We will also be, um, we'll be marching in the parade uh, at 11 a.m., but everyone needs to be there by 10. We'll be giving out um, hand sanitizer that has our logo on it, as well as the pride flag. Um, this will be our first year marching in the Sacramento Pride Festival, so it's gonna be a pretty big year for us. We encourage everyone to um, be like creative, be happy, be outgoing, um, give out items, um, and customize your clothing. That was about, make sure it's also like work appropriate. So, um, well, and, and remember, we have largely vendors here, so we don't need to give too many instructions to our staff. Oh, yeah. But, yeah, my but uh, so that's that is our first Pride uh, participation. And certainly, I think folks are really looking forward to it. Um, I will be out there with folks. It's going to be a beautiful day. So, Look forward to that and hopefully something that we can do for many years to come as well. 
I was not part of the coordinating group, so I just want to thank those of you that have been participating in the coordinating and developing of this activity and other activities that we've been doing. Um, we've got, again, we've like really tried to make our, our calendar very robust, and I love it. There's a lot of great information that is on here. Um, we do have some upcoming vendor forums. We have residential vendor forum. We have EI vendor forum. Um, Adriana, I saw the chat there about the EI survey. All EI vendors should have received the, well, the, uh, the OTPT and speech vendors should have received a copy of the survey. Um, we uh, gave an a update during the, um, we gave an update during the provider advisory committee meeting yesterday that the 637 process continues on for the EI service providers. Um, we are kind of doing a little back and forth with the department. We believe that we've got the authorization to do most of what we need to do to fix the rates for those vendors, but we do need to figure out which vendors we can categorize as usual and customary. Um, I saw Bonnie on here a little bit earlier, and I've seen some other providers on that we've done similar discussions with. Usual and customary rates um, in some cases can be very uh, preferential. I know UCP, I was doing meetings with them this week about it related to their camps. And so um, I would just be open when with uh, if you're a service provider and having a discussion about usual and customary rates um, for your service, especially as um, we're having so many service providers that have very diversified income streams, um, you know, maybe somewhat different than in other times. So um, with that, uh, that survey is already out, right, Adriana? Okay, and then we want uh, full responses back so that we can get the approval from DDS. Um, we need to get the responses back so that we can update our um, calculations on the fiscal impact. Uh, so any questions about that? Um, it is all, oh, thank you, very good. It's due Monday, June 12th. Um, and uh, certainly Jennifer Bloom has been working extremely hard on this and we really want to get this push past the finish line here. So just this last little part of it for the 637. Um, thanks for those that participated in the 637 for CBEM as well. Uh, we are gathering those comments that folks have brought in. And let's see, do we have a flyer there, Carly? Awesome. We have a flyer that has just popped up in our chat. Wait a sec, is it gonna let me view it? I wanna view it. I don't want to save it. Well, maybe I do wanna save it. So that is in the chat for those of you that um, are not able to um, down, I don't know, some people say they can't download things from the Zoom chats, um, but uh, if not, check our calendar of events. And Carly, are you able to share your screen with the flyer real quick? I yep. just don't think I'm able to. Yeah, I can do that. Um, and again, if you um, can access it through the chat, um, it should be up on the calendar um, any any time now. Um, I know we've been um, promoting this the last several weeks, but um, um, for anyone who maybe hasn't been here, uh, the Micro Enterprise Fair will be on June 22nd from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. at the um, Sacramento Alta office. Um, so far, we have um, 17 client vendors um, registered to attend. Um, we still have space for some more. If um, you know any um, clients who own businesses that would like to attend, um, we're also, you know, looking forward to having um, a lot of, um, I know several programs are planning on coming by, just um, bringing um, some of their clients just to um, come by and have fun. Um, it'll be a great event. Um, we're going to have a DJ play music. We're going to have some refreshments. Um, it'll be a lot of fun. So uh, if if you're able to, come stop by. Awesome. Thank you very much. Love the energy in our building is so amazing when we get to host these types of opportunities. So I appreciate the work that went into this. I think what we will do is um, we'll plan on doing a little update on the UC Davis program, maybe for a future uh, week. I do want to plug the upcoming vendor forums, please. Um, transportation service providers talked with you previously. We are going to have a vendor forum on the 22nd. We really want to have everyone attending that. And then Carly, a uh, heads up for the adult and day program. Um, we met with the, our consultant from Sierra College, Rick Larkey, and uh, he was here and, and uh, Michelle was here, actually, Michelle Duchesne. And we are going to have invite Rick to work with you to get an agenda item on the August 24th um, Adult Day and Employment Vendor Forum about the um, uh, Sierra Employment Grant and then uh, kind of to talk about 
also the advisory group that we're putting together too for that and some of the activities. I'd really like to get uh, our community of, you know, day and employment providers more in tune with what's going on with those activities. So yeah, that's wonderful. I'll, I'll connect with them. Awesome. All right. And I don't know if there's anything else in the chat that people put in there. Um, I would look over to, uh, I think we had Jennifer on a little bit earlier and I know I see Michelle's on now. If there's anything from our directors of client services, any Thing major going on? Nope. Nothing but fun. All right. Hey, real quickly, Gary, can you give a little update on uh, the uh, training that you guys got or that you worked on with Alta, Gary Anderson? Let's put you on the spot here, man. Oh, wow. Uh, so, which training are you talking about with Alta that we had? Oh, I was sorry. I they I maybe I got the wrong. Uh, I was the wrong the, guy. But, yeah. Maybe it was the autism training that was done over at On My Own, but we'll, uh, oh, maybe we'll maybe one thing. Oh, that was, um, yeah, that was On My Own Independent Living Services. He's Ooh, with sorry. Yeah. Yeah. We had Mary Rittenhouse come out and she did a great training with our team on, um, um, autism. And then, um, um, we had Herman Kothi come out and he also gave us a training on the Cedars. So we had about 75 employees there. It was great. Great, on my great. own as really you guys have an autism task force or a work group with yeah. with on my own something like that a, a team of clients yes and that, so that. i you know you guys looking at expanding your competencies and then you know trying to get that support from our clinical staff i just i want to put that out there like we have staff at alta that can go out and do these things but you guys have to request it we need to know kind of what those needs are and michelle reached out and was able to arrange that for her agency. And then I got these great reports of how it went. And so I just want to encourage other providers. It's tough. You're hiring new staff. You're teaching people new things. You're dealing with client needs that may have changed over the years. And so um, just want to encourage folks, reach out to us. You know, we can certainly um, provide some supports. You know, it, it doesn't have to be when a vendor is in trouble about something where the regional center comes out and does a training. It can also be if you need a little help in some areas as well. So please uh, don't hesitate to reach out to us about that. And I hope everyone has a great weekend. We are uh, going to definitely do Coffee with Community Services next Friday, but that is a three-day weekend for Alt California Regional Center. That is the Juneteenth holiday. All right. Thank you all very much. And we will look forward to talking to folks next week. Have a great weekend.